Raymond, welcome to the IDFC Institute and to Mumbai. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Here well, to, here I'm happy today. to be here. Um, we're doing this in partnership with our friends at the U.S. Consulate. I should mention that you're speaking in your personal capacity and not for the U.S. government or the consulate. That's right. I'm not in government, and so you're just getting the un unvarnished Ray Vickery. Well, that's, that's delightful. Uh, I should mention for our audience, for our viewers, that uh, Ray has held very senior positions in the U.S. government. He was a key player in the passage of the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Accord, which, which we all know about, served three terms in, in Virginia Assembly, um, and has advised uh, uh, various presidents and candidates, Obama, Vice President Gore, Senator Kerry. Uh, and I wanted to, if I, if I may, uh, Ray, start out with asking you about the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the right. AIIB, yes. which I, I believe you've been quoted as saying um, or remarking that the U.S. in some ways almost shot itself in the foot uh, in, in being sort of behind the curve on this. I wonder if you could share your thoughts with well, us. Well, that's right, uh, Vivek. As you know, I've written an article. It's uh, online in The Diplomat, and I, anybody can look it up. And yeah. I think it was a mistake for the National Security Council of the United States uh, to initially oppose pr particularly British entry into it. And I understand there was some interaction with uh, Australia. I don't believe you could say it reached the point of being the official position of the United States government. Um, President Obama never uh, said anything about it. Nevertheless, my view is that the need in regard to infrastructure, particularly for India, uh, is so great that it's almost a more the merrier kind of um, approach which I would take in regard to getting to the amount of money you need for infrastructure in India. I think, as you probably know, Vivek, that the World Bank has estimated that you need $1.7 trillion by the end of the decade just to meet infrastructure needs alone. And of course, there's a lot of other FDI investment which is needed in uh, schools, hospitals, uh, uh, housing across the board. So my view is that yes, uh, in, if you put this in perspective, that it uh, would make sense to be able to utilize wherever you can get the resource. Now that having been said, it's very important that international standards be met, that it not just be uh, an instrument of uh, trying to uh, co-opt uh, India or anybody else. Sure. But I don't think it's turned out that way yeah. so far. And of course, one of the things is we don't really know what's going to happen with the AIIB because it's not really in existence at this yeah. point. But if I could follow that up, Ray, and, and I mean, do you think it was it was domestic U.S. politics that that sort of shaped the the U.S.'s uh, sort of being something on on the back foot on this, or was it was I mean, the president presumably would have wanted to to reach out in some sense to this new institution, but Congress seem to be recalcitrant. I mean, what, what's your sense of the politics here? Well, we've had a difficult time with uh, international multilateral uh, lending period with the United States Congress. You know, India has its problems with the parliament, and as we've just seen with monsoon closing without really any action, and we've had our own difficulties. And this is not new. We um, had a shutdown of the U.S. government when I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce. So there has been a, uh, a difficulty there. I think that in this instance, the National Security Council initial statements was probably uh, overzealousness, if you will, in terms of U.S. position and, and what was in the United States' interest. You know, there is a tendency among those who deal in power politics uh, to see everything in those terms, geopolitical terms. And I don't think that that's, uh, uh, that's a correct approach. In my view, both the economic and political are part of the same system, so you have to take account of that. But to see everything through a lens of what its political impact is. Uh, Seeing not it a as a zero sum That's game right. in a sense. That's right. And the, the, the reality is that even at 100 billion authorized capital, 
uh, for uh, lending, yeah. uh, and you measure that against a need of 1.7 trillion, yeah. you're not really, uh, and or even if you measure it against other uh, development banks of uh, what 162, I think it is for Asia Development yeah. Bank. And you get into some of the national development banks uh, for Brazil and others, and they're even larger. So I think it's welcome uh, in the sense that if uh, environmental standards are adhered to, uh, there are labor protections, if uh, it's run in a transparent manner, I think it, it, can, be, it can be useful. And I have every um, uh, hope now that with the restructuring, as you know, Vivek, this thing started out one way and it's wound up so being quite a different, different creature uh, and I believe that by the time that there's approval, uh, I assume they'll get the 10 nations they need with yeah. more than 50% of the vote, uh, and after they get some uh, operational rules that it will be very different than perhaps what those in Beijing thought it was going so, to be. So if, if I can perhaps sure. extrapolate from what you're saying. So it's, it's, it's a good development, not necessarily a game changer for the international system. Uh, but if we, you know, part of, I think, the interest in this new institution has been uh, perhaps unease or discomfort in emerging economies like India and China itself of how the Bretton Woods institutions function, the governance of the World Bank and the IMF, the World Bank, in a sense, always headed by an American, the IMF by a European. And, you know, as, as you know as much as I do, Ray, I mean, the, these institutions sort of freeze a balance of global power, economic power, political power, that existed as the Second World War was coming to an end, and the world has changed a lot since then. There's been appetite to reform these institutions, but yet it's not really happened and then you know the, you will know as well the US Congress has held up even fairly minor reforms to the IMF so what, what's your sense of that yeah well there have been some reforms but Vivek I think you're absolutely right if you look at what the situation was after World War II uh, the United States was kind of uh, the last man standing if you will in the sense that the uh, battles had taken place uh, and the destruction uh, in other uh, areas in both uh, Asia and in Europe. Uh, we, uh, thank goodness, were relatively untouched and we had the capital uh, and so and others did not. So when you structure a bank, uh, you know, those with the goal, the golden rule, you know, those with the goal make the rules. Uh, it made some sense and it was a way to get the Congress and others to put it up. I mean, what we did in the Marshall Plan, what we did with World Bank and other um, uh, multinational lending banks reflected that. Well, yeah. those times have changed yeah. and there have been some reforms, but there need to be more. I wrote an article on this as well. Uh, now that India uh, is uh, not just an emerging power, but emerged and China has come along, it's not that we have really decreased as is others, as should be, have come up and that should be reflected in it. But that having been said, uh, it should be recognized that India is the largest borrower from the World Bank. Right. The largest uh, offices outside the United States are in India. Yeah. And so India has been a better fishery and there are those who want to say that this is some uh, instrument of economic imperialism and hark back to the days when there was a need for concern about that. But those days are long gone. Uh, and I think it's important, as you well know, as a professor of economics, that there's a great distinction between World Bank and IMF. And the way in which you would recalibrate for World Bank, it seems to me to be absolutely uh, in favor of uh, much increase in terms of uh, the emerging economies. And for IMF, it will be a, a process of how much reform takes place in regard to uh, the currency which is going on because you've got to have backup before that's what the IMF is yeah. and so 
Both need to be reformed. They have not been. We got our problems with the U.S. Congress. You've got your problems with Parliament, and we need to move forward on those. Uh, we have not moved as fast as we should, and so it's natural that others will try to uh, get in and should uh, should do so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I could just sort of shift gears a bit, uh, Ray, sure. and look at a different topic. I mean, you, yes. you've been traveling in India, and you've been meeting I have. business people and government officials and civil society and, and so on. I mean. Is your sense that there's been a shift um, in the perception, let's say, of U.S. investors in particular looking to India since the Modi government has come to power with its um, pro-business, if you like, its pro-market orientation as compared to what was seen as uh, sort of a stalling of, of reforms under the previous government? What's your sense of that? Well, yes, I think it is, and I think the data bears it out. Uh, if you look at 2014 versus uh, 2013, uh, foreign direct investment up about 22 percent. If you look at the rolling average over the last 12 months, it's about 40 percent up. So, and is that a reflection of changed uh, perception? It is. You know, in Economy and finance uh, perception is often reality. Uh, the trip that uh, Prime Minister Modi made to the United States in September of last year was a great success. Uh, inviting back um, President Obama as the first President of the United States as chief guest during uh, Republic Day. Uh, and the things which were said in Washington, particularly, I was there, uh, I've done a lot of work with the U.S. Indian Business Council over a period of years, and statements such as, we want to put an end to tax terrorism, uh, and uh, that government has no business being in business, yeah. are, you know, uh, warm the hearts of uh, foreign direct investors in India. So I think that that has that has had a very positive effect. Now the question is, will India, uh, setting aside whether it's Modi or whether it's um, the parliament as a whole, will yeah. India be able to pick up the pace again of what has made the Indian economy grow since opening in early 90s? Yeah and go forward not just in process uh, reform. I know you've done a lot of work in regard to ease of doing business. That is very much a part of it. Yeah. But even more so, or even now, it seems to me you need, we need to look at structural matters yeah. as well. Absolutely. And I wonder, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier in your comments that this last session of Parliament, the monsoon session, was, was a washout. There was more uh, as opposed to the rain, which didn't fall. <laughs> I didn't monsoon. use the term washout. I want you to. <laughs> well, no, I know you didn't, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, but a lot of commentators and newspaper headlines. A lot of people are, did. Are saying yes. that uh, without any any kind of major uh, uh, piece of law that was passed by the exactly. GST yeah. uh, or the land bill. So, um, you know, my own sense is Ray that when foreign uh, observers look at a place like India, they say, "Look, why is why are things not happening?" And then I would say, if you look at you mentioned the U.S., where there can be gridlock in Congress. I mean, in a complex democracy like India, it's one thing having a prime minister with a strong mandate, but then actually getting stuff done in Parliament is a whole different yes. kettle of fish. No question about it. President Obama has found that with his Congress, yeah. uh, and it's it's true here now. But that is not an excuse, really, for either us in the United States or for India. And what we have to do is keep our eye on the ball as to what positive comes out of U.S.-India economic engagement. And I believe that the U.S.-India relationship should be recognized as the most important bilateral relationship in the world. And getting us to that point as a driver will be what got us this far, and that is economic engagement that makes it possible and creates interest on both sides for being able to cooperate on strategic matters. Uh, that's excellent. And if I can sort of, perhaps we can follow that up. Uh, I mean, are there some key areas you th do you think where which could be areas of, of 
uh, most fruitful cooperation, let's say for example for US investors looking to to take part in the Make in India story or the India growth story? It, I think there are. I think uh, in defense contracting and production, uh, you know for the very first time this fall, and I take uh, uh, great, uh, not pride, but uh, a positive feeling from having the strategic dialogue being the strategic and commercial dialogue. And one of the items which is going to be uh, discussed there is defense contracting and where we go. Yeah. As you know, there's a defense technology and trade initiative which has uh, four initiatives going. And even more importantly is that we're now having tie-ups uh, in the private sector. And so, and that's in part because caps have been raised, not lifted in uh, yeah. terms of investment. But that is an area in which there is, it seems to me, a great uh, opportunity. I also think, you know, that uh, tying together Make in India with Digital India is a way forward because the, India has some of the best and brightest minds in software and IT and you have proven it with uh, emphasis TCS and across the board and a lot of smaller uh, operations as well and modern manufacturing is not a whole lot of people at an assembly line putting them yeah. together one and one yeah. and so why shouldn't India uh, leapfrog if you will in manufacturing be, by combining its great achievements and sure. abilities in software and IT with manufacturing and make in India. And I think you'll find a lot of appetite for investment in the United yeah. States when they see that that's the way make in India is going. And that could well be how it plays out partly because, um, you know, as you know, Ray, uh, India's labor laws still make it uh, difficult to, to hire and fire workers. So we've not had an, a growth of labor intensive manufacturing as in China or East Asia. So it may well be that it goes a more of a high tech uh, capital intensive route the way that you're suggesting it might. The, then the question that raises is, well, what happens to all of these people coming, you know, there's a million new workers entering the workforce every month looking for a job. Um, where do they end up? I mean, could there be a, a, some social um, problems down the road if these of course. people don't find Of course, work? and uh, I've written on this as well as I think you have in, in terms of whether you're going to have a demographic dividend or a demographic disaster. Absolutely. Uh, and the key to that is what India recognizes in regard to skill development and education. Uh, because the days in which you could take unskilled workers and have widespread employment in an economy are gone. And so there has to be that, but uh, you need, in addition to skill development, you do need labor law reform. And one of the things I think which is a bit disappointing is the unwillingness of um, of the center to tackle that problem. Now it's great that uh, Rajasthan and others under the theory of competitive federalism can do some labor law reform, but there's some things that need a signal uh, from the center. And uh, you know, although if I may interrupt, please. I mean to be fair, the center yeah. has said it wants to do labor law exactly. reform. Will it get through, you know, will the table of bill, will it get through parliament? That's a different debate altogether. Um, Ray, as we sort of come towards the end of our time, uh, if you were just sort of to sum up, I mean, you've come to India often, you're an old India hand in Washington. Would you say on the whole you're upbeat as you look at what's going on here, downbeat, middle beat? What would, how would you summarize things? Well, you have to be upbeat because when you've been coming to India as long as I have, and I started here, I, I came to then Bombay in 1964. Yeah. Uh, and uh, perhaps before you were born, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> true, <laughs> true, yes. the reality is uh, it's a whole different world and the kind of grinding poverty has not been defeated but yes. it has certainly been Reduced, alleviated yeah. and why is that? 
It's because India has opened up to the world, yeah. has decided rather than looking inward, it's going to look outward, going to use market-driven uh, solutions, going to, at the same time, try to provide a greater safety net. So I'm optimistic from what I have seen. Now, would I like it to go faster? Sure. Uh, and I uh, hope and pray that it will. But I'm certainly a, a glass is more than half full person. And I think that the, the, the past has shown us with the bright young people that you have in India that we're going to get our policies right to be able to have greater engagement and that will drive more and more strategic cooperation between the United States and, and India. India. Well, on that optimistic note, uh, Raymond, let me thank you very much on thank behalf you. of the Institute. It's been a real pleasure. It's great to be here. Thank you.